if I lift you up, that's great for us, you know, as the body of Christ. And and it's like I don't I don't want to be over anyone. I want to I want you to stand on my shoulders. Hello and welcome to Deconstructing Worship, a series of positive and constructive conversations about the current culture of modern worship. We are your hosts, Kyle Treble and Steve Quantum. Hi everyone, Kyle here. We just wanted to put a small intro into this episode regarding one of the topics that we discuss and gently include a trigger warning for anyone who has lived through or is currently going through a time of spiritual and controlling abuse, whether that's inside the church or out. Helen, my wife, has bravely come forward to share part of her story regarding this topic in and amongst an amazing and equally life-giving conversation. We really hope that everyone listening gains some kind of comfort or strength from this really important conversation that we have. So please feel encouraged to reach out if you need to. Enjoy the episode. Hi everyone, welcome to episode 7 of the Deconstructing Worship podcast. So good to have you here. Um, so I'm going to hand over straight away to my beautiful co-host Kyle, and um, who is going to um, introduce our very special guest today. This is my wonderful, amazing wife, Helen Treble. Um, so, Helen, hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I am the one wife of Kyle Travel. <laughs> you are my one wife. Only one. <laughs> it's, an inside, it's an inside joke from a past episode. So if you haven't listened to the previous episodes, get to yeah, it. It's good incentive. Um, it's good incentive to listen yeah. to all yeah. the previous episodes just to make sure, at the very <laughs> least, you'll understand all the in jokes. Exactly. So, okay. So I, <laughs> instead of me just kind of monologuing, um, Helen, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, okay. Uh, hi, I am Helen. I am the one wife of Kyle Travel. Uh, I am the mum of our beautiful boy, Sam, who is four years old. Uh, just saying that we named him Sam first and beat the Kardashians to it. Um, we did. Yeah, they copied us, ugh, honestly. Uh, yeah, so I have, oh gosh, I've got a complicated journey with, with worship. I've sung pretty much all my life, but my background is in musical theatre Um and I came to realise that actually my passion and joy was in worship at probably about the age, oh gosh, I was probably about 21, 22 when I realised that that was like, that was my thing. Um, yeah, and I've done uh, some different things. I've led a youth worship group uh, within a local church and I now lead, get to lead worship on Sundays and women's evenings and all those sorts of things so yeah so I've, I'm learning keys which is a wonderful beautiful messy process uh, which I find really challenging uh, because I've never ever played an instrument before it's only just been my vocal so uh, yeah that's that's me I, I, I do have a day job <laughs> <laughs> uh, I work in a school, uh, not teacher, but like support. So uh, yes, creativity is something that I do when I'm out of work. Oh yeah, and I forgot, I also write the blurbs for the podcast now. That's my new thing, um, which I'm super excited about. <laughs> These guys are taking a chance it's on me. It's a family <laughs> affair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's really cool too. There we go. I mean, you've shown your hand now, Helen, because obviously my background's in musical theatre too. So, you know, you know that, oh, you know that we're, we're just going to have to kind of like get together and do duets from like Miss Saigon and The Greatest Showman and Les Mis and, you know, uh, all that uh, stuff. Uh, oh, you know it's happening. Totally it's happen. know it's happening. It's got yeah. to happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. My show days, they're still there. It's very deep, but it comes out every now and then. <laughs> so... Just to inform our beautiful listeners and Steve, obviously I know this, but like, would you give a little bit of a background a bit more kind of deeper into kind of, obviously you come from musical theatre mm -hmm. and you've kind of sung all your life, but what was it about worship music that just clicked with you above every other thing? 
Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think for me, it was that when I encountered worship and I encountered Jesus through worship, then that's when I saw change in me. And almost, I guess for me, um, everybody, I'm an Enneagram 3, saying it loud and proud. Uh, So I struggle with kind of being myself and which obviously lends itself really well to musical theater so i kind of like worship was the first place where i was ever really authentically myself um and there was such uh freedom in that and i found a place where i could just be me and that was okay i didn't have to play a part i didn't have to sound like somebody else i just could be me does that make sense yeah yeah absolutely i will probably cry in this episode (laughs) it's okay i probably (laughs) will too (laughs) let's just let's just hop in on the first question then shall we because we've kind of hinted at some of the things about worship that um they kind of appeal to you above above musical theater but what was where did it begin for you in terms of what was your first experience you can remember of congregational worship? Okay, so uh, I grew up in an Elim Pentecostal church uh, back down in Barry. Uh, yeah, Barry Bados, that's where I grew up. And my parents, you know, obviously, you know, they went to church and they would take me along with them. And I have really, really vivid memories of. Uh, the worship, like music just lodges in my brain anyway. So I remember all the old songs, like, like Graham Kendrick style, you know, all those kind of ones, like we bring a sacrifice of praise, you know, all those kind of ones, <laughs> um, like old school stuff. And I used to love it. I just would want to be surrounded by music all the time. And I, I have, I said, I have real vivid memories of coming out of kids church Um and seeing like people, like pretty much the entire congregation just laid out in the spirit. So um, like the gifts of the spirit, people speaking in tongues, that was quite a normal thing for me, obviously being a Pentecostal church. Um, it was something that was sort of like, oh, you know, some sort of there was speaking tongues and this person's being prayed for. And, you know, it was just, it was the norm for me. So um that was like my first sort of experience of worship. Like I I even remember my mum, like, like we always used to do all the kids songs and stuff before the kids went out to kids church. And like, I remember my mum being heavily pregnant with my younger brother. He's six years younger than me. And there was a song in the actress where I'm going to jump down, turn around, touch the ground and praise the Lord. And seeing my mum great with child, like jumping around. So it was sort of like, I always have Yes, Judith. Yeah, I know. Go, man. I know she listens to the podcast. Woo, woo, go, man. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I have really fond memories of those times. Like, it, it's it's still there. So you've kind of hinted already that your journey with worship was a bit of a complex one. Yeah. Um, after that initial experience at the church in Barry, what at what point did it start to get... Uh, for want of a a more delicate word, complicated. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so a little bit of my story. Uh, I went to audition for um, some universities. Um, People probably know the names of all their kind of big drama schools, but at the time I didn't get into any of the ones that I really wanted to go to. So I quote unquote hated God at the time because he killed my dream and I was never going to sing ever again because my dream had died. And I remember like, driving back in the car with my dad and just feeling like like a complete and utter failure. And I was like, God, you've let me down. I thought this is what I was supposed to do. I was doing this for you. You know, all this stuff that you tell yourself, like, you know, I was doing this for you, Jesus. Um when in truth, I was only really doing it for myself. So I didn't sing um, like performance-wise or, or anything like that for about two years, which is killer because like singing is so much a part of who I am. Um, 
I, I, I was kind of going to church and but I wasn't really fully engaged and I, I, there was this this guy um I, I hope he gets to come on the podcast in the future his name is Dylan and I used to see him up on platform worshiping and he carries something so special and I just was drawn to it and I was like what on earth like and I remember like talking to him after the service because we would travel up on Sunday nights to go um, because our church in Barry didn't have a, an evening service. I remember going up and, and speaking to Dylan like, oh my gosh, you're amazing. Like, And he was like, well, you should join. Like, you should join the team. And I was like, oh, oh yeah, oh, okay. And I, I kind of put it off. And he, every time I speak to him, he'd be like, you should join the team. And I was like, okay. So, and then I kind of like took the plunge and, you know, kind of signed up to the choir and uh, my faith journey was never one of those, I guess, Damascus Road experiences. It was never one of those like, hey, I'm going to go to the altar and give my life to Jesus. It was more of that gradual realisation of, oh, wow, Jesus is totally real to me. Um, and I think my journey with worship was probably the same you know, it was very much like, a, okay, I'm going to dip my toe in here. I'm going to find out a bit more about this. Um, and I think that's kind of like, it's been more of like a, a process rather than a, a kind of like night and day kind of moment. Does that make sense? Mm. I remember like watching watching this process um like, like me and Helen have been together since we were 15. Um, and Aww, I remember... I love you. Childhood sweethearts. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I remember watching this process and it, it's it's heartbreaking because when you see... When you see something in someone that you just want to... You want to call out and you're like... you Like, obviously, you're not just one... You're not just made for one thing. Like, Jesus like gives us with many things and, and he gives us people to meet and all this stuff. But, like music is just in you and i remember watching this process of you like almost throwing it throwing it away and then coming back um through this amazing beautiful man dylan like honestly he is he is awesome um and he's one of the most kind gentle people that i have ever met and i remember watching this this man kind of like bring bring helen from this place of i never want to sing again um into this place of like oh maybe maybe I, maybe I can. Um, and it it was, it was so amazing. Like what do you, so how, what, what was like kind of the emotional kind of process of kind of stepping back in? Oh, I was terrified. Like I was absolutely terrified because it had that thing or the fear of, I could fail at this too. Um, yeah, again, anyone who knows anything about the Enneagram 3 is terrified of failure um, because we get our value from what we do. But I, yeah, I was afraid. I afraid I, I wasn't going to be good enough and that I wasn't going to get chosen or picked. And yeah, for me, again, it, it was sort of like at first it was that, or maybe I can find my self-worth in this. But gradually as I, you know, as you sing, the truth of who you are in Christ, then it starts to change you and you start to kind of think, maybe I can believe this. Maybe I can. And yeah, it was um it was very much at first, I guess, and I know I, I'm gonna touch on this later, very much like, oh, I want the leaders to like me. You know, I want to do all the right things so that they like me. So, you know, you play the game, you know, when, when, when at first, but yeah, but then it was more, as I said, the more you sing the truth of yourself, you can't, you just can't not start to believe it because the spirit in you just testifies to it. I love that, um, <clears throat> that aspirational nature of worship, right? Because like, I remember being in churches in the past where, you know, there's been backlash from some particular songs because really cynical people have been like, like, oh, well, that's, that's not true, is it? <laughs> you know, so like, you're saying like, oh, you know, oh, I'm giving you my heart and all this. But no, no, that's not true, is it? That's not true. And it's just like, well, there's no. And But the thing is, like, and I said this in a previous episode, we do. We become like what we worship. Yeah. And that kind of, it's so important to 
I, I believe, and I, and, and I think it sounds like you agree, that in yeah. terms to declare those kind of aspirational truths over ourselves and our lives and our lives' trajectory, yeah. um, it's just so important, isn't it? Oh, totally. I mean, I find that, I guess, as I said, for me, music sticks in my head. I can remember songs from forever ago, from when I was a kid. And I think when you sing things, and even if you're not at the point where you really believe it, it lodges in your brain somewhere and it it takes hold, I think, faster than just speaking words. That when you sing something over yourself or when you sing something out where you don't believe, like I, I remember like praying murmur for a friend of mine who was in hospital and just feeling so afraid for her and for him and their family and I was and I just couldn't stop singing surrounded and you know it's like it's like it may look like I'm surrounded but I'm surrounded by you and just singing it and singing it and it's like I was afraid in myself but I was singing something and it gave me gave me hope you know and just because you doubt and I, I, I realise now, or I'm beginning to realise now, how important doubt is to my faith growing. Um, but don't like that because I want the answers. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, but seeing those truths, even if I don't, or part of me doesn't believe them, by seeing them, it, become, it, it starts to become your inner self-talk. And you start to see yourself with more compassion and kindness instead of like beating yourself up all the time. You know, like it, you can't sing I am a child of God with and then like beat yourself up in the next sentence because you're like, OK, well, one of them is really true and the other one is a lie that I'm believing in my mind, you know. Mm. Yeah, I think it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, that the kind of part that doubt plays in, in the whole process, right, because... It leaves, I've heard it said, um, again, I picked this up from Dustin Kendry's podcast, but he was quoting someone else, uh, but the opposite of faith isn't doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, and, yes. Which is incredible. And doesn't that mean that that kind of space of doubt when we're singing things like, I am a child of God and we're yeah. struggling to believe it. Yeah. Do, doesn't that doubt leave, um, leave almost like a door open for us to to believe it at some point in the future. You know what I mean? Because if you've got certainty mm. over that, you go, if you sing, I am a child of God, <laughs> and in you, you're like, I am certain I am not. <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, yeah, but the, when, when you, if there's doubt, if there's space for that kind of, oh, I don't yeah. know. Um, but, you know, it leaves space for the yes, I am to come in. You know? yeah. Totally. And, and doubt always leads to questions and... You know, everything I've read in the Bible, God has never told anyone off by, like, asking a question. He's always been open to questions, you know, even, you know, when Moses was like, well, who are you? And he's like, I am. Okay, you may need to ch reference check that because that, that may have been Abraham. <laughs> there is someone in the Old Testament. <laughs> hey, if Mark... Um, some old guy. Yeah, if... If Mark can misquote scripture and it's in the Bible, then I'm sure I can get away with it. <laughs> God isn't afraid of questions. I think we're more afraid of questions. Yeah. Because... We like to be certain, don't we? Oh, of course we do. Of course C we do. Certainty is safe. Yeah. I mean, and like, like, like through this kind of past year where we've kind of had different questions about our <laughs> yeah. faith and about theology and things like this like it's a really scary place to be terrifying and, you know I mean? like, and like I, I was speaking to someone um the other day and like just like bringing it back to like worship stuff and like theology and the understanding of theology can change so yeah. much and like obviously you've been through times in, in the not too distant past where like grace was not found in in the the kind of rhetoric that was coming from church and things like that and it was very much yeah. very like fire brimstone sort of preaching but the, the song has always been full of 
love and and, and grace and stuff and and like yeah the, it's it trying to like trying to find different like okay what what is the truth like what is like what is real in but like no matter how much you try and dig and and, mm. and and stuff, it always comes back to how loved we are. Oh, um, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming back to like what you were saying earlier about like that you can't have that, that dichotomy of kind of going, I am a child of God, singing that song and declaring that over yourself, whilst also kind of like feeling awful and like like not liking certain parts about you and, and things like that. Yeah. Like I had experience the other night where like God was just speaking some just truth and life over me. And there's a little part of you that's like, I don't know if I believe this. Um, and like, we can all be like that. And then this, this one, this one man said like the, like the true kind of picture of humility is believing what God says about you. Yes. Which I mean like, so like yes, God, yes, made, yes. God made you, God says this about you. Yeah. Like you can't, you can't change that. So it's like trying to come into alignment. And I think like music helps so much. You're so right there. Yeah, you, you just start you just start to believe it. And I heard um I heard Joseph Prince talk once about when you worship, like even throughout the day, like people if there's anyone who I work with, they can attest listening, they can attest to this. Cause I I I have to spend lots of time walking around the school. And I, I'm always singing, like all the time. Like people have complained about me singing, um, which is just <laughs> ridiculous because some people dislike joy. Uh, but I remember, <laughs> I remember Joseph Prince saying, that when you worship and when you're like, you're sort of like worshiping in your heart to God, you're constantly being refreshed by his spirit. And he's like, wherever you are, doesn't matter what you're doing. When when you when you worship and when you hold God in that in that place, that you are constantly being refreshed by the Spirit, and it just like it helps you get through the day. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like I I can't I can't go a day without singing or worshiping. It just it's not in me to 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 be quiet. And and again, I, I know I'll I'll talk about this later, but because I was quiet for so long and in my walk with God and in my journey through life I have held back and sort of hid my voice and having gone through a journey of processing that I'm not going to do it anymore <laughs> I'm not going to be quiet anymore you know that yeah yeah I think I think that's a really lovely place to kind of go into the second question okay um so what would you say is your favorite thing about congregational worship? <laughs> I've, I've been thinking about this one. Um, I was funny enough, I was thinking about it today. And I was like, I don't know how to answer this because it's too much. How do I pick just one thing? Um, <laughs> for me, it is the experience of people meeting Jesus and having an encounter with him because that's where things change. It's when you encounter Jesus in those moments where we are changed. I mean, I'm not not just the miraculous, life-changing in a moment thing, but those moments where you believe that there is more in every sense of what that means for your life, for your walk with God, for your family. It's those moments that just, and I love seeing it break out. I love that. I, I, like the other week we were singing all hail King Jesus. And I could, there was just this moment where the congregation just, and they all just like lifted their hands and you could just kind of just feel the atmosphere and and you could see it breaking out. And, and I'm like, I I love going, Hey everyone, look, here's Jesus. Say hi. (laughs) You know, I, I kind of take that stance with it. It's sort of, just seeing people encounter him because I've seen how it changes people. I know how it's changed me in so many times in my life. So I think that is my favorite thing is, is the encounter moments that, mm. that I have and that people have in, in the presence of God. It's so true, isn't it? Of like, you know, when Jesus walked the earth in the New Testament, because um, obviously he was famous. Like, so many people had heard about him. 
Um, but it was those, it was the face to face encounters, wasn't it? Those, those are the ones that were so transformative, you know, uh, I mean, I'm sure there were people whose lives were transformed just by hearing his teaching, just, you know, the, the thousands who gathered on the hillsides, mm. but those aren't recorded for us. You know, the people who kind of went home and said over their lunch with their, you know, with their families said, they had this really great talk today. <laughs> um, it's, you know, I mean, it's the, it's the people yeah. who... He was quite a good communicator. He was like... <laughs> yes, what, what, is, what a good communicator that Jesus is. Yeah, did very well for a, for a carpenter's son. Yeah, he doesn't like um, those Pharisees, though. <laughs> Exactly. But you know what I mean? It's, it's, and I love that. I love that. It's those face-to-face encounters, isn't it? That are just utterly transformative. Yes, it is those face-to-face encounters that are so transformative. You know, you, you know, where Jesus, where either people have reached out and touched Jesus, or Jesus has reached out and and touched them. And I think that's what, um, and I think that's what worship is. I really do. What do you think? What do you think it is about worship and the encounter and the encounters you can like have through worship that is different like for you? Um, Cause it may be different for other people, but like, obviously you can encounter God in everything. Like you can encounter God by seeing a, a sunset or like walking up the mm. mountain or, or just through a friendship or you can encounter God through, do you know what I mean? This, I, I I'd be here for days listening to the ways that you can encounter him. But what what is what is different for you about worship, like musical worship, that is just so much more? Part of it is the permissioning of it, if that's a word. That's a word. We'll uh, go with that one. <laughs> it's a, it's sort of like that creating intentional space where you are gonna fix your eyes on Jesus um I think as well it like Jesus is everywhere around us his fullness is in us and we are in him all the time that doesn't change but I feel that in that atmosphere of worship like musical worship your awareness of that heightens like I can't have more of Jesus I already have all that he is you know, it's more mm. about me letting him have more of me, like letting him, like opening oh, wow. up my heart to allow him to do what he wants to do in me. So I think for me, having that music is that, okay, you have permission here or you have space here to to worship. And it, and it doesn't even have to be like instruments like at the moment we're like we're doing like kids church to like backing tracks and stuff and we were doing lion in the lamb and i was like i was having just as much an encounter with jesus as if it was you know the synth going on (laughs) you know what i mean i yeah so for me i mean like i again I, i meet god in all those places that that you just said in love and friendships and mountains and sunsets um but there's just this, it's, it, I, I don't know. Like, even when people say like, okay, let's pray. Um, and, and everyone kind of like launches into praying and speaking in tongues and stuff. I just start humming or I just start like woeing or because that's like my instant, like, like, okay. Okay. God, I'm listening to you. Like, okay. What, what do you want to say? I know for me, it's just it's your love. It's your love language. Yeah. Yeah, is that is that a love language? Should I start singing to you, Kyle? <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah, I'd love, like wake up in the morning, I could have a little song. It'd be great. <laughs> I mean, I'm not great in the morning, so I might be like, mm, sure. <laughs> but inside I'll be enjoying it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just because I want to, I want to kind of come back, uh, like touch on something you said then, and you you were talking about how at the moment for the uh, for the family service we we we're using like video and and pre recorded songs and and stuff, um, and it's and like like I say it's it's great and it's obviously there's a lot we've talked about this on previous episodes like there's many 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 ways you can worship there's many genres there's many like different instruments you can use and and and, and stuff like that mm. <clears throat> and. Obviously, these things are great, and like we touched, we kind of talked about it in episode three with Abby, and talking yeah. about how like like we are emotional beings, and and like God mm. is giving us given mm. us these tools and and these these like emotional responses to build us up and to and to push us forward and and stuff like that. 
And I love what you're talking about then, like how you had just as much an encounter worshipping and along to a video as you do in like, say you went to like a big conference. Um, I, I remember like one of my like very first kind of encounters with Jesus through worship, um, was uh, we were kind of doing this little discipleship program with this oh, amazing yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, I remember. With this amazing man called Dave. And he's like, honestly, he's had such an influence on me. Like such a humble, awesome man. But we used to kind of, there was just a couple of us and um, we used to go along uh, like weekly to this little kind of, it wasn't like the main church building. It was this little kind of... House on the side. Yeah, it was this kind of like probably 10 foot by six foot room. I think it wasn't tiny, tiny wasn't it? Yeah. Um, but like we used to always start with worship and like me being a brand new Christian and it, I, like I, it was the most powerful thing in the world. Like we would literally, we had this little tiny kind of like boom box, this little tiny little thing. And like the, the, the speaker quality was awful. We just play like, CDs. Like, but I, I think about that now. I didn't think about it at the time. We'd play CDs and like, honestly, we were on our faces in that, in that room mm-hmm. and it was the most glorious, amazing thing. Um, would you touch on just kind of like kind of dive a bit deeper into how you feel and how you react with different styles and different kind of ways of worshipping? Okay. Uh, Oh, that's interesting. Um, I think I have created almost or cultivated a vulnerability within me to be open to the spirit in whatever form that takes. Like I, I I'll often like blast stuff from my car, like gospel music. I like, I love the stuff that Mav City is doing. I love Travis Green. Mm. Oh my God, Travis Green. Yeah. Just, just like listen to him on the way to work this morning. It was just, yeah, you know, and Israel Houghton and all that kind of stuff. I love gospel music. It's just, amazing it there's just nothing like it when you just want to get you happy on um and i think i've experienced worship in so many forms like you said just like a cd in a room with a bunch of believers who are just after god's heart and i think that's the difference i think that's what it if you're after god's heart even though you have it already but when you're like okay this is real I think it doesn't matter then what the style is or whether it is just a guy with a guitar or someone with a keyboard or someone plays a bum note. Like I, that used to bother me. Like that used to like seriously bother me like on a on a Sunday. And I used to be like, oh my God, she's singing out of tune. Oh, they're not doing that right. And oh, they missed the building. Oh, they didn't do the proper. And, and I used to, used to drive me insane. But that was when I was tied up in the fact that it had to be perfect. And I think as I let myself off the hook about me being perfect, then everything else could have license to not be perfect. I love that. I love that. Because I think a lot of a lot of things that kind of we do in life will stem from how we talk to ourselves, won't it? Yes. So I guess that brings us to um, the third question. The killer question. Uh, speaking Da-da! of, uh, speaking of vulnerability. Question. Oh, God, yeah. Oh. <laughs> the third one. We love the third question. Okay, so the third question. Um, the, um, you know, your experience of congregational worship, um, it, it just seems like you've hinted at some struggles, some difficulties, but it seems it seems like from how you're talking that your experience has been overwhelmingly positive. But... Um, yeah. What would what is what is one thing that you would change about congregational worship culture? If oh you could? God, this is a really hard question because I have like I have tossed and turned about how on earth I'm going to talk about this um, and say in the and I don't know I don't know how else to say it other than uh, for me it. It comes to a, I guess, leadership side of things and how um, worship teams are run and managed and who they are run and managed by.
by and the accountability that comes with that. Yeah, the accountability. There should be more accountability that leaders are in the right space to be leaders and that they are not just after power or they are looking to fulfill some part of them that they're not fulfilling outside of church. Uh, My own experience where I felt, well, I was manipulated and, well, I mean, there's no other way to say it other than it was spiritual abuse um, and there was no, there was no accountability. There was no way, there was no way that you could go. And it was very much, um, I think for me, it's, it's that safeguarding of, of people, of people in your teams. I think that that's something that needs to change. And I, and I hate to say that. I know it's not everywhere. I don't want to be that, that person because I don't want to, because first of all, it, it doesn't it doesn't validate my experience and it and I know it won't validate other people's experience, but I think we need to be careful with who we place in leadership positions. And this is really hard to say. <laughs> yeah. No, you, you are you are so right. Um and and I think like that like that goes throughout the church, not just kind mm. of worship teams and things like that. I mean that goes through life, doesn't it? Like if you're in a business and things you want. You yeah. want the people leading that company or team who have that company's or teams or whatever the thing is, that like they, they have their like in the in the center of their mind and hearts and they want the best for it. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. you, like I've like I've experienced nowhere near what you have. Um and to see just like like come back to the point where you made where you where you were talking about how like it's very prevalent where you yeah. will see people kind of trying to get position and and leadership positions in, in in churches to kind of fulfill this kind of thing that they wanted to happen outside of the church and it didn't and the, and the the church is kind of like that kind of big fish small pond sort of thing isn't it yeah like out out in the world I'm like I'm nobody, but like I'm, maybe I could be someone in in this church, and yeah. it all becomes about position and power, and you forget that you forget the people that surround you. Yeah. Um, would you kind of mind? And like obviously, I know it's a very vulnerable place. Mm. Would you mind kind of just explain a little bit more, talking about what you kind of experienced through that? Yeah. Um, what happened with me uh, was. I mean, I, I was part of a team for a very long time and cracks started to show when I saw how other people were being treated. Um, and, you know, those, those things where, you know, when you see, like, um, I'm probably going to be branded a heretic for saying that I like Darren Brown, but I like Darren Brown. <laughs> uh, and when he says... You know, when he, like, he puts, like, little sneaky messages in, you know, sort of subliminally, and he says odd things that you kind of go, huh? And, but you completely, like, disregard, because that would be too weird that he, if he said that in in real life, you know? Um, I guess it was things like that. I, you want, I want to believe the best in people, Um but I could see that uh, like people would leave and we, they were never spoken of again. And yeah, people would be leading and then all of a sudden not leading anymore and nothing was said. Um, It got to the point where so many people had left. I (laughs) I got the opportunity to kind of step up more in a, a leadership role you know I've been running a youth band for for a while um uh, which I was still doing and uh and someone took a disliking to me because of the people started noticing me if that makes sense you know and you know I'd get encouragement about how I led worship, being sensitive to the spirit, and then, and then there would be these snide comments, and 
little digs and put downs and it escalated over what was it, about four years i think kai yeah um, yeah and it got to you know I, there were times where like there was someone leading and if anybody knows or has anybody ever seen me lead worship or even see me in a congregation i move i can't not move when i worship um and i remember um i remember someone coming up to me and holding me on the shoulders and going will you just stand still and i was like oh my gosh and it got to the point where i was not i wasn't worshiping authentically because i was just doing what i could to survive and continue to be a part of the team and it yeah it got to the point where i was like okay this this has got to stop because i want i want to quit this you know and for me to say that i can't do this anymore that's when it got it got real and it played into all my insecurities about um my self-worth my self-value that i wasn't good enough um and that it was such a hard time for me because everything that I thought and everything I thought was my safe space wasn't actually safe at all. And I was, I was so bound up. I took a year and a half off uh, leading worship. I knew, I knew, you know, when it was sort of, when I made that decision, it was going to be a long time. And I saw some therapy. I highly recommend anyone out there who is listening to this, who is contemplating getting any sort of help or therapy or anything, do it because for me, it helped me find my voice again. And it was part of my journey to stepping back into the room of leading worship and leading a congregation in worship there's been a lot of fear a lot of anxiety a lot of self-doubt in that journey um i'm you know what you're like it's, i'm not fully free but i'm so much freer than i was like i still have that that pattern of thought of you know when i move in and move in free worship you get that thing of i shouldn't have done that I, sh- I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have, I should have just kept quiet because what, what if I, and I'm going to get emotional. What if I got that wrong, you know? Or what if someone's not happy with that? And it, and it shouldn't matter because, you know, God delights in us as his children. And as we, as we worship in his presence, you know, he delights in us. And um, so that's a, a, an massive journey that I've been on. Um, but, you know, when you look back at those things that have been like the hardest things in your life and you're like, and it, and it was like horrendous, but the lessons that you've learned because of what you've been through are like treasure. I will never, ever allow myself to be in that situation again where I am, where I'm manipulated and I'm held sway by the opinion of somebody else um i'll never i'll never be there again and i'll never ever let myself be bound up again because i fought so hard and i've been on such a journey to to experience freedom in worship and i want to say to anyone out there who compares themselves to the big worship guys you know well i'm not like I'm not like Jay Johnson, you know, I'm like, my one is like, I'm not like Amanda Cook, you know, um, you don't have to be like them. You just have to be you. And God doesn't need another one of those. He needs you. And however you worship is amazing. However, if you are a mover like me who can't stand still, if you, if you, if you do stand still and you just raise your arms a little bit it, uh, as long as your heart towards god is authentic then the people will follow you people will follow you into the mm. presence of god and i think that's like 
my biggest takeaway is like worshiping in freedom encourages others to do the same um our entry point into this conversation thank you so much for being so vulnerable by the way um that can't be an easy thing to do but thank you um but our entry point into this was accountability Mm. and you know like and i've seen you know that and unfortunately there are so many entryways for abusive people you know they Mm. are married to pastors or they are you know they just happen to be in a season where the church doesn't have many musicians the church needs musicians and so overlooks a number of character flaws that i'm in but what um like because you know the question i kind of kept asking myself throughout um and this is not me victim blaming at all but it's just to say why what why you know with all these people who are clearly falling victim to the same abuser yeah why you know what were the consequences where, where was the accountability and i think i guess that's the point isn't it what would that what do you think that accountability should have looked like because the from what you're describing the victims were not protected in the way that they should have been there was no one to go to people who were around in the team mostly if you've been there any length of time knew what was what was really going on um but i the leadership didn't they had no idea they had absolutely no clue because it all just looked so shiny and i think everybody was too afraid to say anything in case they were ostracized and i i think you're getting him later on in the uh season i think adam uh he sent me this book called Escaping the Maze of Spiritual Abuse by Dr. Lisa Oakley and Justin Humphreys. And he sent that to me quite early on in my, my sort of therapeutic journey. And I just fell apart because I was reading my story. You know, some of the things that like people people talked about, you know, there's lots of like personal testimony in here of, of experiences that they had. And it, it was like, oh my God, I'm not the only one, because you blame yourself. Well, I did. I mean, I guess that's kind of how it works, isn't it? You know, I and I think one of the massive wake-up calls for me um, was at the time I was working um, for an organisation that supported uh, uh, families and, and kind of provided like therapeutic intervention. And I saw as part of a training course, um, the cycle of abuse and I saw it and I thought oh my god that's me like that's what I'm going through like I could just it was like it's on a piece of paper in front of my face and I was like oh my goodness and that's when I was and and having my having my son was like oh there there is no way I am letting him go through this you know and that and that's when we kind of we decided to kind of like okay it's time to go (laughs) I can't, I can't, I can't keep being bashed across the head like this, you know? So, yeah, it's been, it's been a long journey. Um, mm. And it's a journey that I'm still on, you know, around like that vulnerability and, and shame and, and where you place your self-worth and the lies that you believe about yourself, you know? Because, yeah, it was just ingrained in my mind and you know it takes time to break those patterns of thought yeah i'm i mean like i know kind of i know this stuff now and like i was kind of i remember learning this stuff kind of like after the fact because i mean victims victims do they they keep it quiet don't they because like you said you you blame yourself you think why why is this happening it must be my fault and i don't want to i don't want to tell anyone um and I remember learning all this stuff. After, I kind of, I saw pieces here and there, um, and I remember kind of, kind of, because you want to confront it, don't you? You want, you want to kind of like talk to. Do you want to talk to people? And so I remember like say like, and you were. I remember you being petrified. And I, I want to tell this story because I know there's going to be people out there that have been in it in these positions. Um, and I remember like, hey, I remember being like, hey, we need to go talk to these these people. Um, and like you, you were Petra, you did, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do no. it. And, and this is only after me only like knowing a little bit of what had been going on. 
And I remember going and meeting and it was so like defensive straight away. And there was this like denial and almost this like, oh, like. Gaslighting. Oh, no. Yeah, like, yeah, gaslighting, per- yeah, perfect word. It was, it was like, oh, no, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And I don't remember. And we're like, I don't remember saying that. I don't remember doing that. And it was like, what are we like? And to come back to kind of Steve's question of like <clears throat> accountability, it, it was so hard to figure out how that would even look. Because, yeah. I mean, like the people who were like, you were, you were having this situation with like who do you go to above above them because like we'd we'd seen it in the in the past where like obviously we didn't know people's stories in in completion but we saw little snippets like you said earlier of of this of this happening and like obviously but then you're kind of like because we were quite quite pally with with these people who you had this with towards the beginning ish um yeah. no we like we were um oh well, I thought we were and and like and obviously you want to you want to kind of like trust you want to trust your leaders this is before any like we experienced anything or you you experienced it really um and, and like you're told little things of like and and, and then you kind of discount what you see almost you kind of think oh well, maybe that's just it's just rumors it's not it's not really like that and you kind of obviously you want to see the feed- best in people and then they feed you their own rhetoric and their own story yeah. of, of why people have gone and what's really happened. And because yeah. you trust them, you, you believe it. Um, yeah. And again, it's that, it's that gaslighting, isn't it? Of like, you doubt yourself. And like, even now, like, there's no hate towards any of them. And I just, the question that I held inside for so long, I was like, what, what did I do? Like, what did I do wrong? Sorry. You don't have to say sorry. I think, like, I mean, we've we talked about this. Like, the answer is you did nothing wrong. And to kind of bring it back to kind of how you how you introduced this, um, talking about kind of people wanting position and power. And, like, I mean, we're all, we're all kind of broken in some sort of yeah. way. And not to use that in this, like, derogatory way of, like, you're all broken and stuff like that. But, like... You know, it's okay that we're broken too, but like you've got people who are seeking power and position because they feel so powerless in their day to day lives and and things like that. And that doesn't, there's no excuses. There's never an excuse for abuse. Um, and you kind of think like, how, how do you try and like, how, how do you stop this happening? Because like like we were talking about earlier it's like there, there's many ways like it could be like steve said oh there's a lack of musicians so we'll just we'll just let people in or there may be that maybe the current leader is kind of that way inclined anyway so it just like the leadership he gets around him will just you know you kind of reproduce after your own kind don't you how how do we tackle that problem of position seeking people gaining those positions like it's so hard it is and the thing that kind of comes to mind is that people in leadership shouldn't be untouchable no matter how helpful or amicable they are people shouldn't be they they, they should be a culture or a you know like in any in any big company there, there's always a whistleblowing policy do you know? And to have, I mean, that should be something within churches, that there should be a whistleblowing policy um, where you can go and talk to someone where you will be treated with dignity and you can share your issues or, or whatever it is that you want you want to say. And, and, and I get, like, church leaders get so much flack and all that, you know, they get so many people complaining because nobody's ever happy with anything they do because you can't please everyone, but this should be avenues built into the organisational structure of churches or of places of worship where you can go and say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what I'm experiencing. Or I think you need to be made aware of this. Um, 
yeah, I think that's what it should be. It's part of the safeguarding policy. I think it should be part, and, and it should be something that's shared with people so that they're aware that they can. And again, that creates honesty, that creates transparency, and that thing of like, okay, if there is something going on, then we need to know about it, you know? So it's sort of like that, hey, we're the leadership, but, you know, our eyes aren't everywhere. So there is this avenue that you can come and you can come and talk to us. Or if you don't want to talk to us, there are these other people that we're held accountable to, you know? Does that make sense? Mm. What do you think, um, just throwing the question out there, what do you think it is about church culture and worship teams culture that makes uh, makes these places such rich breeding grounds for abusive behavior it's a very seen ministry you know you are very visible to the congregation and um maybe that in and of itself draws people who need to be you know who need to be seen and given praise for what they do you know and even like again as an enneagram three like that's that's my that's my thing you know like that's one thing that i've wrestled with and and again and having people in teams it, it building that relationship because if you build enough of a relationship with someone you're going to see what their internal motivations are you know the closer you get to someone the more you see who they really are and you know, you kind of got all this thing like, oh, we've got to get the people with the right heart. We've got to have the right heart. You know, servant. You know, the the servant heart kind of analogy that everybody loves to use and bands about in worship teams and and all sorts of teams within church. But I think you can't judge someone based on the ministry that they want to get into. It, it all stems from a place of relationship. It's like you've got to get to know people to. To know who they are and um, why they're doing things. I think you've hit on something there, actually. Um, the whole idea of being servant-hearted. Um, it like you know we we've you know had a bit of an inversion on our view of childlike faith recently. <laughs> in, in that when when we kind of like in in we'd been previously kind of taught or given the very strong impression that childlike faith is quiet and submissive and unquestioning but anyone who has kids knows that they are not quiet submissive and unquestioning so actually you know it's um but it's when phrases like scripturally based phrases like childlike faith like servant heartedness become a stick to hit someone with yeah in order to in order to make them submit Mm -hmm. because it's just like well you're not being very servant hearted um yeah, and how do, how do you battle that? What do you say? What do you say back to that? I mean, like, because you know your heart, and when when you hear, well, we just need a servant heart. Well, what do you say to that? We're taught to doubt our hearts. Yeah, like we're taught that our heart. We're taught that our hearts are the scriptures. Obviously, you know, yeah. there, there is the famous scripture that says the heart is a deceitful thing. But I would be very interested in kind of exploring the context of that a bit more because actually, mm. if Jesus lives in our hearts, then how deceptive can the heart truly really be? That's a side issue. Um, <laughs> like, you know, it's um, you know, darkness cannot isn't stronger than light. Yeah. Um, but like, we need to maybe take a side step away from this. Is like you know, because we kind of joked about in the in the first episode, didn't we, about the whole safe self-effacing. Christianity, where people will come to someone and say, like, oh, you played so well. And it's like, oh, it wasn't me, it was the Lord, you know. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Um, and we kind of joked about that. But that, I, I don't know, is that almost, is that kind of mindset yeah. almost like a gateway drug to be, you know, a gateway to being exploited by abusers? Because, like, you, you can shut a person down. You can shut down any kind of possible allegations by breaking a person's spirit. Um, you know, by you know, you can shut that down straight away just by accusing them of not being servant hearted and because it's dressed up in the right scriptural language and because they're in a position of leadership, you know. Um I, I just I yeah, I just find myself wondering what what 
the long-term benefit. Maybe they're not even thinking of the long-term benefit, people like this, but what is the long-term benefit? Because eventually the long-term result, the undeniable long-term result is, you know, everybody around you leaves because they're sick of being abused by you and you're left alone on your little island of power. <laughs> then I guess that would be it. Like, it's control. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, but then obviously then then there's, there's you go to a new church and there's an inflow of new volunteers. And da, da, da. So maybe there's just something deeper that needs to happen in church culture, in worship culture, where we actually have to unpick a lot of this God sees me as a filthy worm theology. Yeah. Because he doesn't see us that way, right? Yeah, definitely. And I think as well that, I guess I can only speak from my experiences, that especially as a, a vocalist um, with no other musical sort of background or, you know, not being able to play any instrument, it was very much the, the almost wanting to sing and lead worship was almost like well you shouldn't want that like wanting to do it was a bad thing because it, it just I laugh about it now but it, because it seems so ridiculous but it's like well you shouldn't want that because you're just after position and you should be willing to serve anyway because that's what people with certain hearts do I think like what you said there I, I, it's it's funny because you, you like you, and it was only for the singers i remember and it was only for the singers like the the, the musicians were kind of like they, they never had this um not that singing isn't isn't being a musician but you you know what i mean um and like instrumentalists it, yeah yeah like I, I i remember like what you said then is like you're being told like you need to have a servant heart you shouldn't want this it's not about position da 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 all coming from someone who was there for power for position I mean, like you, you, we, there's that kind of phrase of like, you see the bad in people that you see in yourself, don't you? A hundred percent. Yeah. Katie and I say this all the time. This is just like the thing that annoys you most about other people is something that definitely is something that irritates you about yourself. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. I wanted to kind of, cause you touched on something earlier, um, Steve, when you said kind of like, what is it about? kind of that this ministry of, of worship and things like that that kind of does and it's not it's not the only place and it's like it's like it's not it's not just churches and things like that and see i'm using a phrase that i don't like i, I you feel like you have to sometimes so i don't want i want don't want to use the, those phrases um like what is it about those positions and I, I was kind of thinking and i'd like to kind of talk about this um and and don't get me wrong i love so many like worship songs and and there's so many like great wonderful powerful worship songs that kind of in this kind of modern kind of ccm i guess um that i love and god has used so much to talk to me and i'm part of do you know what I mean like i i i i just, I, I play this stuff um it's, it's amazing but like you see like the big hill songs and and the and the Bethels and the elevations and stuff. And it's, it's, it's almost like it's stardom, isn't it? And like, I think it is like, it, we've created this image, even like, even in like the small local church that is trying to be like Hillsong or things like that. We're creating these, like the, these roles or these like, or almost like narratives of like, he is like, he is the stardom because like, well, I mean, you see like that, I mean, that like, like and not in a bad way like, like the rock stars do you know I mean like that's that's awesome like that's cool like do you know I mean like i don't know you got like um ah oh, i'm so bad with names uh who's the guy that runs united joe houston <laughs> joe houston like he's amazing right and like and this is ministry and like his lyrics have touched me so much like and god has used his songs so much do you know what I mean but like his job is a musician he does massive arenas and stuff like Tommy's he's, he's a rock star and that's a like, that's not a bad thing that's a really cool thing that's what he's been kind of brought into and stuff like that Dom, I don't know him personally um but like we we see that and we kind of think oh well may, like maybe if I if I can get there well maybe I maybe I can I can be that and I'm talking in more of a negative way now maybe I can be a rock star maybe I can maybe I can have some notoriety that I'm not getting in my life outside of church and then what happens then is you you step on people. You're, you're there for position instead of people. And I think the main th thing we have to realize is 
if you get into any kind of ministry, and especially worship, and I say that just because I'm involved in worship, especially worship, you have to be there for God and people over position all the time. Do you know what I mean? And it's just like, and we're human. We're obviously we're human. We, we want to be seen. It's that tribal mentality, isn't it? Like we, we've had, this is so much in our DNA. We want to be seen in the tribe. We want to be, you know what I mean? Because if you're not, you're, you're outside the tribe and there's wild animals that can eat you. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but obviously we don't live, we don't live in those times anymore. But that is still part of us, not to give an excuse at all. But we need to check ourselves and we need people around us that love us and we need to like hey say hey how you doing do you mean like we need our leadership needs people around them that can be like hey how you doing with this stuff yeah the church shouldn't be a stepping stone for your career the church is the bride of christ who you should love and cherish yeah you know even the people who annoy you can't sing properly (laughs) Do you know, I'm making a joke. I'm not, you know, and that, and that's the thing is that oh, I read something and I think it, again, I may be branded a heretic for this. Um, I've been reading Everything is Spiritual by Rob Bell and it, there's, a, there's a quote in the, in the book. If you look close enough at me, you'll see you. And if I look close enough at you, I'll see me. And again, it's that relationship of we're supposed to be in intimate connection with one another and I think that's what it is is when you have that relationship with people and you're that close with people you don't want to use them as a stepping stone you don't want to push them out of the way you want to lift them up because you see what's good for them is good for you because we're all part of the body so it's if I if I lift you up that's great for us you know as the body of Christ and and it's like I don't I don't want to be over anyone i want to i want you to stand on my shoulders and i know again that's that's so cliche and i know it, it's it's used so often in that in those kind of ways of like, oh we just want to stand on my shoulders but it's true that that's genuinely what i want it's that how can i support you in you going beyond what i ever could you know and, and that's the thing is we can do more together than we can on our own you know i mean like even jesus said even jesus said You've seen the miracles that I've done and you will do far greater. Like, like he wanted us to, like, he wants us to stand on his shoulders. And if, if the creator of the universe can say that, then how much more can we say that? Yeah, he's our model, you know? It's like, we want to be like him. So let's see what, you know, his attitudes are and the way he does things. You know, and Jesus was always against anything that put burdens and oppression on people. You know, and, and they were the religious leaders of his day. And I think that we should be like him in that respect of anything that puts burdens and oppression on people. Wherever we see that, whether that's in the world, in in organisations, in and even in, especially in the church, you know, we should be a place of freedom. We should be different than what's going on out there. And that's what should make us attractive is our love for one another. Absolutely. Um, So I guess bringing it into land, um, I just recognize and want to acknowledge that there's every likelihood that there may well be people listening to this podcast who are experiencing spiritual abuse right now. And to be honest, Helen, I would just love to love for you to, I don't know, what would you say as someone who's experienced it, who's come out the other side of it, if anybody who's listening to this podcast right now is experiencing spiritual abuse, what is it that you would say to them? It's not your fault. It's definitely, it's not your fault because I blame myself for so long. And if you can and go to someone and tell them what's going on, because the likelihood is that you'll probably get a me too moment. If you can go higher, if there is someone that you can speak to, if that avenue is available to you, do it. Do it in order to to protect the people that will come after you and to protect yourself. Um, you don't have to stay in it. You, you don't have to sit in it. You don't have to allow yourself to experience this kind of abuse and you can, you can walk away. I know because I did. And if you need it, get the help 
you know, speak to someone, get a counsellor or therapy if you're living in the States, um, read books. Um, as I said, the one that um, I spoke about earlier, Entangling the Maze of Spiritual Abuse, or sorry, it's Escaping the Maze of Spiritual Abuse. I'll pop a link to that in the, in the show notes. Um, read it because it's so eye-opening. You, it's okay, you can breathe and you can be yourself and there is hope. There is hope to come out the other end and there are people out there in the church who will love you exactly as you are and Jesus loves you exactly as you are and you don't have to change. You know, he just loves you and accepts you in all your beautifulness and you are worth more and I'm with you. Thank you. (laughs) Yes, thank you so much, Helen. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Deconstructing Worship. We hope that you got as much from it as we did. Uh, We would absolutely love to have you all involved in these conversations. So please find us at Instagram and YouTube, both under the handle at Deconstructing Worship. And please send in any emails with any questions or anything that you would love involved uh, within any kind of future episodes. And our email is deconstructingworship at gmail.com. And we will talk to you next week. Bye-bye.